maybe wait for more people, a couple more people come. closer. Right. Yeah, maybe. Can I start or not? It's already on? Yet. And the people in the waiting room are invited? Ah, so everybody is, is here. Ah, and they're already there. Yeah, I never understand these things. <laughs> so, well, there are fewer live people than last time, so I hope people keep coming in person uh, because it's much more fun to talk to people than only, only virtually. Uh, this I don't need anymore. Also, one of the participants told me that when I answer questions from the room, people on the Zoom can't hear the question, so I should repeat it. So if I forget, please remind me to repeat the question out loud. I, I knew that, but I completely forgot. And I'll certainly forget again. So today will be a little, uh, I mean, I hope it will be some fun, but not one of the uh, uh, most unexpected parts of the course, partly because I'm going to explain things that I explained in a published paper. And some of you may have looked at it. But that is the advantage that if you need a reference, there actually is one. Maybe I'll mention it at the end. So I'm not yet going to talk about uh, Cauchy's form and the circle method. That will come because this sort of has to come first. So I won't discuss the example I mentioned last time of Sterling's formula and why e is not the square root of 2 pi, although I'm curious next time I'll ask if anybody looked at that. But what I do want to talk about is actually several related topics, uh, of which the most important is, well, I'll, I'll just say Mellon transform, but I'm not sure how the name should really be pronounced, whether it's Mellon or Melin, or I'll just say Mellon because I'm speaking English. Uh, so the Mellon transform is something that one uses all the time. And then I'll talk about uh, and an extension to functions that where the usual definition doesn't seem to quite make sense. So, and applications, I don't have to say each time because everything in this course is not theory. It's about examples and applications to concrete problems. But in particular, I'll talk about L values, which I mentioned last time, the special values of L series. I want to give in some detail, but not the complete details, the example I mentioned last time of the Casimir effect, which led to this rather bizarre function, which was the sum over all triples of integers of the square root of L squared plus M squared plus some constant times N squared. Obviously very divergent. The terms go to infinity. And one question is how to make sense of that. And having made sense of that, how to make effective sense so you can compute it to, for instance, 50 or 100 digits given lambda and also the asymptotics. And that's a nice example of how to use the Mellon transform. And if I get to it today, which I think I will, I'll also talk about sums of the forms. So I mentioned this in the list of topics yesterday. So I have some nice function f, where nice will be made a little more precise later, but mostly will not be very precise. But it's such that it's small at infinity, 
And so if t is a positive number, you can ask for the infinite sum f of nt. And the question is, how does that behave as t goes to 0? So and all of these topics are interrelated, and they will uh, be related probably next time with the Cauchy's form, the circle method, and so on, with, with more applications closer to number theory or combinatorics. So I start with the Mellon transform. So I'll start in the classical situation when everything is well defined. I assume that I have a function. It could be complex valued, but I might as well assume it's real. I could look at the real and imaginary part separately. So I have some function, let's call it phi of t, defined on the positive real axis. And I want to assume for the moment that the function is small here. We're small. For the moment, let's say it could mean very small, like it decays faster than any negative power of t at infinity. And I'll also be assuming for the moment that it's smooth here. OK, so that's my, my function. It's a test function. It might be smooth. It might be only actually, I think if it is continuous, it's more than enough for what I'm doing. I'm not going to worry about analytic uh, questions like how general the theorems are in all of the examples. Phi will also be, always be some very nicely behaved function. And then one defines the Mellon transform. I won't write the word again. The Mellon transform, which I'll denote with the tilde, is the integral from 0 to infinity, phi of t, t to the, t to the s minus 1 dt. So one could say, why well, call it s minus 1? It's just t to a complex power. And of course, one could put t to the s, but it has better properties if you do this. And one reason is this the product of a multiplicative function of t. t goes to t to the s is a homomorphism. If you multiply two t's, you multiply the values. And then the, the measure for multiplication is not dt. It's dt over t, because when you're multiplying numbers, you're adding their logs. So it's very natural to write it that way. And this plays a role, certainly, in all of number theory, including when you do, like Jacques Langland's theory, you write fancier Mellon transforms over some adelic space. But the idea is still the same basic thing. And essentially, all L functions are understood when they are understood, which they're often not, by trying to write them as some known multiple of some Mellon transform of some known function. So that's the Mellon transform. And uh, I want to do a couple of things with it of which the main thing is to make sense of it when the function is not necessarily smooth at 0 and not necessarily very small at infinity. So I want to extend it. That's not a big thing. Theoretically, it's easy. But it's not certainly universally known. And it's incredibly useful to know how to do that. So in the final analysis, we're going to have allow functions that might, for instance, be exponentially, uh, not exponentially big, but big like powers of t at infinity and also big like powers of t here, and then the integral will never converge for any s at all. So what we want to do is take this thing, which originally converges somewhere, and extend it to an analytic function. But here we have a function that doesn't converge anywhere. There seems to be nothing to extend. But it turns out there's a very wide class of functions for which you can make perfectly good sense of this. And the idea goes back to Riemann and his famous paper of 1859 on the zeta function, where essentially that's exactly what he did. So I'll explain that. In a second, before I did that, so I mentioned that this is all, uh, I have a, a long, longish paper. It's not a, a research paper. It's an appendix to the book I mentioned last time by Zeidler, the founding director of the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Physical Sciences in Leipzig, who wrote, uh, who was planning, wrote several volumes of a many-volume introduction to quantum field theory for mathematicians, and asked me about this Casimir effect, which I mentioned. And then in the end, I wrote a 25-page like appendix explaining various useful techniques. And all of the things I'm going to tell you today are in there. So if you've read it, you can fall asleep or just remember what you read. OK, so first, a couple of trivial properties, uh, just so one gets used to the function. But these are all completely obvious. I have to take my notes so I don't remember. And so here we have 5 t. And here I have the Mellon transform, phi tilde of s. But now if I vary phi of t in various kind of trivial ways, like I could rescale in the t axis, I could consider phi of lambda t, where lambda is a positive number, then it's uh, completely trivial from the integral to see that it's phi tilde of s. But all of the properties I'm going to write down, they aren't even properties, these transformations will also be true in the more general class where the integral 
phi is not necessarily given, phi hat, by this integral because the integral might not converge, but these properties will all still be true. Then another one is t to the lambda, but here I don't even have to call it lambda. I can, it's, it can be complex, so I'll call it alpha. If I multiply uh, phi of t by power of t, then rather trivially, in this I'm just shifting s by alpha, so that's completely obvious. Of course, this is also obvious just by shifting t to 1 over lambda t. Similarly, if I take phi of t to the lambda, but now lambda should again be a positive number because I want the positive real axis to go to the positive real axis, then you get lambda inverse phi tilde. All of these are completely trivial to prove. I'm just listing some obvious transformations so that you know if you know it for one function, you know it for all related functions if they're related in this simple way. Then a special case actually is phi of 1 over t, which is when lambda's inverse is, uh, sorry, I wrote, this is s over lambda. There still has to be an s. And here this is simply phi tilde of minus lambda, uh, of minus s. Now it doesn't seem to quite make sense because if lambda is minus 1, there should be a minus sign. If lambda is minus 1, it should be minus 5 minus s. So let's pretend it's a minus. I copied this from the paper from my notes, and maybe there's a slight hiccup. And then the last thing is if you differentiate 5, of course, you can then differentiate as many times as you want. Just repeat this. Then you replace phi tilde of s by phi tilde of s minus 1, uh, but you also multiply by 1 minus s. And again, you... You get that, assuming the integral makes sense, just by integration by parts. So these are kind of boring properties, but just to show that you know, changing phi in some simple ways changes phi tilde in a simple way. So now, where does this thing converge? Well, let's assume first, so, well, the actual, the initial situation actually is even better. It's, uh, and this is very frequently what you encounter, if the function is very small, by very small, I'll simply mean more than polynomial decay, at both zero and infinity. So when t is small, it's smaller than any positive power of t. And when t is large, it's smaller than any negative power of t. Well, in both cases, than any power of t, but in particular those. And in that case, phi tilde of s is an entire function, meaning that it's simply a holomorphic function in the entire complex plane. Because since phi convert is smaller than any power of s, then the integral is uh, rapidly and uh, absolutely convergent near zero and near infinity. So we want to know what happens if it's not so. So this is actually the first situation. And the second situation is let's assume that the function is smooth at zero but not extremely small. Then in this situation, sorry? I certainly didn't say, I wrote here, I, I drew a picture. This is not compactly supported. It goes to, I said it's small. Small does not mean zero. And so I'm small. <laughs> so no, no, this function is small. I said it decays more rapidly than any power. So one over t to the 10th, for instance, e to the minus t. But it certainly doesn't have to be zero beyond some point. It's no. Of course, that's a special case. Here also, this function, I mean, I, this was meant to be a graph of function that's very small, but it's not, it's not zero. No, it's just small. So then the integral converges. So I didn't repeat your question. The question was, does phi have to be or does one care if phi is compactly supported? That's, of course, a special case of being small, and then phi tilde would be entire. But you don't need compact support. You only need small at both sides. But let's assume that I'm in the much more frequent case, when phi is maybe small, often even exponentially small at infinity, but it's not incredibly small at zero, but it's really smooth. And remember, I emphasized that last time, because although everyone should know that, sometimes people don't realize that it's the same thing they've seen. To say that phi is smooth at infinity means that it has a Taylor expansion, which matches the function to order zero, to order one, to order two, to each order. So that means that phi is equivalent, uh, asymptotic, to all orders. By the way, that's another confusion in mathematics. Sometimes people write f tilde with g as the argument goes to, let's say, 0 or infinity, and only mean that the ratio tends to 1. That's the weakest. But sometimes they mean in the stronger sense that the entire asymptotic expansion is the same. And I won't be careful, so sometimes I've used double equivalence, but it's too much trouble 
I obviously wouldn't write this if I only meant the weak, weakest notion because I could just put A0. Why keep the smaller terms? So if I write an infinite sum, it's kind of implicit that it's meant to be meaningful. So remember, so this is A0 plus A1t plus A2t squared and so on. There's no requirement on these numbers An that they have any growth. I mean, An might grow like e to the n factorial. So this series may be completely divergent, but each An individually exists and is simply, of course, by Taylor's formula, the nth derivative of phi at 0 divided by n factorial. And that might be big, but whatever it is, it's whatever it is. So we're assuming that it's smooth, which means that it has an asymptotic expansion, meaning that the difference between phi and a finite sum here is O of the first term that you've omitted for no matter where you truncate the sum. And so then, so the first thing is, in this situation, if it's smooth, then in particular it's O of 1 because it's finite. And then you see immediately that phi tilde of S is holomorphic for real part of S bigger than 0. Because this integral, the only place the integral can diverge is near 0 or near infinity. Near infinity, it's very small. And near 0, this is O of 1. And so if S is strictly smaller than 1, uh, so strictly smaller than, sorry, strictly bigger than 0, then I'm integrating a power which is bigger than the minus first power, and I'm allowed to do that. So this function will certainly be holomorphic. Well, the integral converges, and it converges locally uniformly, blah, blah, blah. So it's a holomorphic function in the real part, uh, in the half plane where the real part of S is strictly positive. So here I should put a dotted line. And sometimes I'll write sigma because it's standard in number theory, sigma for the real part of S. But I'll try not to, but if I use sigma, that's what I mean. OK, so now what can you do in this situation? Well, the claim is in this situation, when it's small at infinity, if it's simply bounded at 0, that's already enough to get that phi tilde is holomorphic in this half plane. But I'm assuming much more than bounded. I'm assuming it has a full asymptotic development. So now what can I do? Well, it's a, a fairly easy idea. We're worried about what happens near 0 and near infinity. So let me break up the integral into two pieces. And I'll just go from 0 to 1 and 1 to infinity. But in, a, in other applications, it's important to remember that I could go from 0 to capital T and from capital T to infinity and have the freedom of changing T. And in examples, that'll be very important. So for the moment, just since it plays no role yet, I'll take the simplest choice and break up the interval, the integral into two pieces. Now I break up the, the second term I'm not going to touch. So all of this is when the real part of S is very big, which in this case simply means bigger than 0. But I could even allow some negative powers of t. Then everything I'm saying is still true if S is originally big enough. So this integral, even if I of t blew up like t to the minus 7, so even if I had some negative powers, a minus 1 over t and so on, this would certainly converge and be holomorphic for real part of S large. But what do I do for the first part? Well, I use that this is an asymptotic sum. So this is equal to this sum, 0 to 1. And I subtract the beginning of the asymptotic expansion. So the first n terms, I sum n from 0 to n minus 1, a and t to the n. And then I have to add that part, of course, back in. OK. So, But remember, my s is originally very big. Well, here it's simply bigger than 0. That's good enough. So n plus s minus 1 is bigger than minus 1. I can integrate that. The integral of t to the n plus s minus 1 dt is t to the n plus s. And if I sub com compute that at 1, I get 1. If I compute it at 0, sorry, t to the n plus s over n plus s. And I'm evaluated that at 0 and at 1. But at 1, t to the n plus s is just 1. And at 0 is 0, because n is greater than or equal to 0, and s is, uh, has, is bigger than 0, a real part of s bigger than 0. And therefore, th this integral, I can do each one uh, very easily, just in my head. It's simply a n over n plus s. And then the last term, as I say, I'm not going to touch. Now, this difference, by definition, is bounded. I assume everyone knows the big O notation. It means it's less than a constant, which can depend on uh, n. 
so I should put O sub n, but, the, but for all t, as t goes to 0, this difference is at most some fixed multiple of t to the n. That's what asymptotic expansions mean, that if you take the first n terms, the error is at most the order of, but smaller than the last term. Here it's of the order of the next term. So because of that, this thing is holomorphic in a bigger half plane. Namely, if the real part of s, sigma, is bigger than minus n rather than bigger than 0, as it was before. So now n might be 100. I've subtracted 100 terms. Now I've extended this from 0 to minus 100. So I have a much, much bigger half plane. And this integral now makes sense there, because this is O of t to the n. n plus s is positive. And so the integral of t to the n plus s minus 1 near 0 is finite. This was holomorphic for all s. And this one is not holomorphic uh, because it has poles, but it's, it's defined for all complex numbers. It's a meromorphic function. And it's a simple pole at uh, s, equ s, s equals 0, minus 1, minus 2. And so what we see is that phi tilde of s is the sum n from 0 to n minus 1, a n over n plus s, plus holomorphic in the plane sigma real part of s bigger than minus n. But that's true for every n. I just picked an n out of the sky. So if I let n go to infinity, you see it's meromorphic. And therefore, phi tilde is, extends meromorphically. The, rich, the integral doesn't converge, but the function. So it extends, I'll just say it is meromorphic, because of course the extension is then unique, is meromorphic in uh, C with simple poles at s equals minus n, where n is 0, 1, 2, et cetera. And the residue is exactly the number a n, which was the nth coefficient of the Taylor series. So that's extremely simple. It's certainly very well known. And most of you have probably seen that. But I want to emphasize that it's a very, very simple argument. And you don't need complex contour integrals that people sometimes take funny loops that go around 0. You just break up the integral from 0 to something and something to infinity. And you get this very smoothly. So I can first, well, I can write that down. The, unfortunately, this doesn't erase at all well. And if I take the wet one, then I can't write again. Maybe there's other chalk that doesn't stick as much. Uh, so what we have so far is in this situation, if phi is equal to some, well, asymptotic to the sum a n t to the n at 0 and small, very small, at infinity, then I'll just put phi tilde is equal to the sum n from 0 to infinity a n over n to the s uh, plus holomorphic. Of course, this doesn't make any sense because a n might grow like n factorial. That series might converge. But again, I mean, if you take any finite part of it, that gives you finitely many poles. And the further poles are more and more to the left. So in other words, this function is a meromorphic continuation. From the blue box, this one or this one? This? Well, I'll try. Sorry? Or this one? This box? There are many boxes. I'm not at all sure there's going to be a difference, but just remind me, I'll move the green one out of harm's way. Thank you. OK, so this was the first situation. And by the way, here, we could be more general. We could have aj, t to the power lambda j. It doesn't have to be a power series. In integral powers of t, I might have t to the square root of 2, t to the square root of 3. All I really need is that the lambda j's, or their real part, actually, are going to infinity. And then it'll be the same. Phi tilde in the same sense is equal to the sum with exactly the same proof, uh, s plus lambda j. In other words, the Mellon transform, which originally is only defined in a half plane sufficiently to the right, specifically to the right of minus lambda 1, if, if the lambdas are increasing, it will now extend meromorphically to the whole complex plane. And it will have simple poles at the negatives of the lambda j's. One can be even more general. So I'm still taking the case when it's small than infinity, but something at 0. But another case that sometimes arises, you might have, for instance, a term. I don't have to write the sum each time because it's additive. 
if there's a term t to the lambda log t, or more generally t to the log, lambda log to the n of t, then I will still get a, a, a pole at lambda, sorry, s plus lambda. That pole now will have order n plus 1, and the residue won't be 1 or a, a lambda if there was if there was an a lambda, it will now be uh, minus 1 to the n times n factorial. And so you, know, it's, it, it's, so you get arbitrarily, maromor arbitrarily maromorphic functions. You're going to have poles of higher order. And the easiest way to see that that's the only thing it can be, just think of a single term, t to the lambda, and now differentiate in lambda. The derivative of t to the lambda, which is e to the lambda log t, is t to the lambda log t. And the derivative of 1 over s plus lambda is minus 1 over s plus lambda squared. And now you just keep doing it, differentiate n times. So these are slightly more general things, but they quite often occur. I mean, one has functions that has, have powers that are half integral or square roots or something different. And one also has a series that, are, that have some log terms. OK, now you can, of course, have exactly the same in the opposite direction. So we might have a function which is very small here but which at infinity it looks like some power. So here it looks like some b lambda. Well, I can call it bjt to the j, or I can call it, let me keep the notations straight. Uh, it's, I don't remember if I put plus or minus. I think it's, uh, well, first of all, if it's simply o, let me start again. If the function is small at infinity, but here it's O of t to the minus a for some a. That's including what I did. Then phi tilde is already holomorphic in the half plane sigma bigger than a, uh, sigma bigger than a. So you have to go, if a is very big, so you have a big pole, you have to go more to the right. And similarly, just by inverting phi with one of the formulas I wrote before, if it's very small at infinity, but it, it, at zero, I mean, but at infinity, it's like t to the minus b then phi tilde is holomorphic in sigma less than b. So in particular, if you have a function that's reasonably small, but not necessarily extremely small at both ends, so you have it's o of t to the minus a at one end, o of t to the minus b, then the original integral will converge in a strip. And that strip will be when the real part of it sigma is between a and b. But a might be bigger than b, then that strip is empty. Then the integral never converges. And even if the integral does convert somewhere, you want to extend analytically to both the left and the right. But then you just do the same thing. Because, of course, in the situation when it's small at 0 but has some, let's say it has some expansion bj t to the beta j or something at, uh, at infinity, then you do exactly the same as before. You split up the integral. And the only difference is that the part that you have to look at is integral in a half plane far to the left rather than to the right. But anyway, you just replace t by t inverse and s by essentially minus s. So it's very easy here to see that we get a function which is holomorphic in both directions. But if you have both, the interesting case is when the function, when a, so if, if I have both values, so it's like t to the a, then I'll be fine if sigma's between a and b. But first of all, as I said, that's not all we want. We want the function to be extended to the whole complex plane. And on top of it, b, a is often bigger than b. And then this would be the empty set. So the, the original integral may never converge. But now, of course, the solution is more or less obvious. So I'll introduce terminology that is only not standard. I only thought of it while I was, right now, while I was erasing. Let's call the function very nice. Uh, function is just a sum, maybe even a finite sum to start with, a sum of terms you know, t to the alpha. And because of what I just said, we might even allow some powers of log t. Maybe it's even a finite sum. So let's so those are things we feel we can handle. And now let me imagine that my function can be corrected by a nice function at infinity and by maybe another nice function at 0, such that it's small at both ends. Now, then this sum might not be finite. Like when I had my asymptotic expansion, I could correct by a finite piece of it and make it smaller and smaller. If I wanted to make it extremely small, I had to take 
take the limit. But if we imagine that it has such a behavior at each end, then I can use this trick for the left integral to extend to, a, to the left and for the right integral to extend to the right. So now let me do it. It's a very simple idea, and it's very easy to see. So now let's assume that phi is nice at both ends. Uh, so again, I want to make sure I have the same notation that I have. So let's assume that it's the sum a n t to the n as t goes to 0. Or again, I could also put a n. Doesn't really matter. I can even uh, put t to the power alpha j. I mean, it doesn't have to be just integers. But the alpha j's are going to infinity, or the real part is going to infinity. Now it doesn't matter if j starts at 0 or 1. It's just a meaningless index. And let's assume that it has some other expansion, bj t to the beta j, as t goes to infinity, where now, of course, the beta j's, or the real parts, have to go to minus infinity, because the terms have to be getting smaller and smaller. So let's assume that. Then what I do is first pretending that the integral does converge. I mean, let's start with the function where it converges. I write phi tilde of s as the sum of phi less than or equal to t tilde of s, which is the integral from 0 to t, 5t t to the s minus 1 dt, plus the integral phi tilde t greater than t of s, which is, of course, the same integral from t to infinity. And obviously, if it converges somewhere, like in that strip that we had when a happened to be smaller than b, then I can add up these two things, and I get the right answer. And although both of these pieces depend on t, uh, their sum, of course, won't depend on t, obviously, because it's the whole integral. But even if the whole integral never makes sense, this one, I can use exactly the argument I just used, that the integral on the left, if phi of t looks like this, then this thing is meromorphic in the whole, half, in the whole complex plane, in all of C, with simple poles of residue alpha, uh, aj at s equals minus alpha j, by the same argument I just gave you. And if you want to make it more general, but there's no point filling up the board with notation, if I determine t to the alpha times log t cubed, then this would become minus 3 factorial divided by s plus alpha to the fourth. So I mean, you can get higher order poles if you want. And similarly, this one is meromorphic in all of C. I mean, it starts originally, this one converges in a plane way to the right. And this converges in a plane way to the left. And those original planes might even be disjoint. But each one separately converges in a half plane. And each one separately, if I make this assumption of asymptotic expansions, where the exponents don't have to be just 1, 2, 3. They could be any sequence of, of real numbers or complex numbers with real part going to infinity and minus infinity. Then I will get that these two functions separately are each meromorphic. And so this one will have simple poles. And again, it wouldn't be simple if I allowed log, log terms. Simple poles, and they will be bj. I think now it's minus bj over s plus beta j. So except for a change of sign, it's the same formula. So it is poles at s equals minus alpha j, where alpha j are the exponents at 0. The other term is poles at s equals minus beta j. And the residues are aj and minus bj, respectively. Now, let's assume that maybe those, those two half planes don't even intersect. But still, these functions each make sense. So now, let me put here meromorphic continuation. And here, let me put meromorphic continuation. And let me take that as the definition. Before, that wasn't a definition. It was a fact, because the original integral converged somewhere. And once it converges, I can break it up, the integral from 0 to t, the integral from t to infinity. But now assume it doesn't converge anywhere. I can still, this has a meromorphic continuation to all s. So does that. So the sum of them is a meromorphic function in the entire complex plane with only simple poles. And the simple poles are at the minus alphs and minus beta, and the residue is aj minus the corresponding bj. So I mean, it could be that some alpha is, is on both sides, and then you'd have to subtract aj minus bj. Now, you might say, yes, but this depends on t. But of course, it doesn't depend on t. Because if you look at the definition, phi less than or equal to t tilde in some half plane is defined simply by this integral, when s is very large. And similarly, this one is defined by the same integral with, t going, with s, little t going from t to infinity. 
So now I see that if I take uh, here's some t, and here's some other t prime, let's say it's bigger, and I compare phi less than or equal to t prime minus phi less than or equal to t, that will just be the integral from t to t prime of phi of t, t to the s minus 1 dt. But if I look at phi greater than or equal to t prime minus phi greater than or equal to t, that will be minus the same integral. And this integral, this now is compactly supported. This integral makes sense, and it's obviously a holomorphic function for all s in the complex plane. I'm integrating over a bounded interval. So therefore, when I add this and this, I get the same as when I add this and this. I'm, I'm, uh, the, 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 this thing just cancels. So the sum of the two things uh, kind of obviously is independent of the choice of t, but each one has been separately continued. And so in this way, we have the very useful fact. This was all extremely easy, but it's not obvious if you haven't thought of it. Certainly before Riemann, I don't think anyone had ever done this or didn't do it this way at all, uh, that this is a, a very nice way to take something given the Sumerian transform and make sense of it even when the integral is completely uh, meaningless. OK, so now let's start looking how that looks in practice. So I should have mentioned that the original Mellon transform, when I look at the original Mellon transform, let's call it M for Mellon or Mellon, uh, phi to phi tilde, and this is, let's say, very small, or even compactly supported, small at 0 and infinity. And this is holomorphic functions in the whole complex plane, then this function is injective. If the Mellon transform of this function is identically zero, the fun it, then the function will be zero, which means if two functions have the same Mellon transform, they're equal. And there's actually an explicit formula due, I think, to Mellon himself, which I'll write down. I don't think I'll ever use it. You pick any complex number C, any real number C, and you integrate over the vertical line real part of sigma C. And this phi tilde, sorry, phi, this is phi of t. Phi of t, it turns out that the Mellon transform, in this case, will be very small on vertical lines. And so when I take phi tilde of s on a vertical line, it's smaller than any power of t. So if I multiply here by t to the minus s rather than t to the s minus 1 as before, this integral converges, makes sense, and it's a standard theorem but that gives you the original function. So it's in... Uh, because I'm sleepy. Thank you. The question for those who didn't hear is why I wrote dt instead of ds, and the reason is that it was a mistake. Thank you. Okay, so I don't care about that form, but it's injected. But the new one, the generalized one, is not at all. Now we have, so this was the set of functions which are small. If I look at functions, functions on t, let's say reasonably smooth, continuous, whatever you need, on r plus, with asymptotic expansions to all orders, just as powers of t, or maybe powers of p times integral powers of log t, asymptotic to asymptotic series to all orders at both 0 and infinity, which is the larger class, then I've just defined a Mellon transform. And it's, it's well defined. It was independent of the choice of t. And of course, it extends the old one. But now it goes into meromorphic functions on c. And now it's not injective at all. So let's take example one, which is if t, if phi of t is simply t to, the, t to the alpha, just a pure power. Well, obviously, the original integral is the integral from 0 to infinity t to the alpha plus s minus 1 dt. This always diverges. It never converges. So this, as a definition, would be useless. But my due definition is absolutely fine at 0. The asymptotic development of this thing to all orders is just t to the alpha. And so by what I told you, you get 1 over s plus alpha. But in infinity, it's also t to the alpha to all orders. And so by what I also told you, you get minus 1 over s plus alpha. And so that's 0. And so in this case, the, it's not at all injective. Any such function is Mellon transform identically 0. And therefore, any finite combination of such functions. And of course, also, if I put t to the alpha times log t to the n where alpha is a complex number and n is a non-negative integer. Then, as I said, I would have here minus 1 to the n, n factorial over s plus alpha to the n plus 1, minus exactly the same thing. It just drops out. Uh, anyway, it kind of has to, because if I have 
uh, as I already said, t to the alpha log t is just the derivative in alpha of t to the alpha. So if it was identically zero, the derivative of zero is still zero. So all of these things go under the Mellon transform to zero. This came up many years ago in a paper of, of, of mine. I, I was talking about it to Pierre Deligne, who's a good friend. And he said, oh, well, this class of functions, so this is what I called nice before, kind of finite combinations of pure powers of t, complex powers, or complex powers of t times non-negative integral powers of log t. And he says, so there's an intrinsic description of that. I'll just say it for fun. These are the gm finite functions. So gm is the fancy language for the multiplicative group, which here, since we're on the real line, would be the multiplicative group of positive real numbers. And that acts on functions. That's what we had right at the beginning, 5 lambda t. But now you see, if my 5t, I shouldn't use the same t. If 5t was t to the alpha, then 5 lambda t is just a multiple of that. It's lambda to the alpha t to the alpha. So therefore, it's an eigenfunction. And that's true for any lambda. So therefore, the span under the whole multiplicative group is just multiples of that function. It's one dimensional. Similarly, if I have t to the alpha log t, and I replace t by lambda t, I'll get lambda alpha times t to the alpha log t plus, uh, now I probably can't do it, it'll be lambda to the alpha log lambda, I guess, times t to the alpha. So therefore, it's not an eigenfunction, but this, the two-dimensional space spanned by t to the alpha and t to the alpha log t, that space is preserved by this, and you get a little triangular matrix for the action. And more generally, if you have a function which is a finite sum of powers of t, complex powers of t times integral powers of log t, then that function spans, if you take all the functions with the same power as alpha, but n less than or equal to the given n, that's a finite dimensional space, and it's invariant under the action of the multiplicative group. So that's what's called, uh, if you have any group acting on any vector space, g acting on v, a g finite vector is a vector whose orbit under g lies in a finite dimensional space. It spans something finite dimensional. It doesn't matter at all for anything, but it's a nice comment that that's kind of the intrinsic meaning. So this new thing, you're losing information in a sense, but it's very boring information because, of course, we want to understand 5t, and we certainly understand pure powers of t. So I'm throwing away pure powers of t, which actually already means we could have done with a little less work because I could have taken the powers of t on one side, subtracted them, putting them on the other side, and then I'd make one of my half planes bigger and one smaller, and I didn't have to do argue on both sides separately. OK, so that's a kind of a stupid example where the Mellon transform is zero. Let's take one where it's a little less uh, trivial. So I re recall the definition given by Euler of the gamma function, except he called it pi of s plus 1. So his pi interpolated n factorial, and the modern gamma interpolates n minus 1 factorial. At some point, people shifted the, the thing because it was more convenient. The gamma function is defined uh, at least for real part of s bigger than 0 by this integral. So it's simply the Mellon transform of e to the minus t. And more generally, if 5t is a pure exponential, e to the minus lambda t with lambda positive, then phi tilde of s is simply the gamma function multiplied by lambda to the minus s. That was, well, it's obvious, but it was one of the rules I wrote at the beginning when you replace t by lambda t. So this is incredibly useful. Because when you have a Dirichlet series, a Dirichlet series is an infinite sum, not of terms uh, s to the n, like a power series, but of terms something to the s. So it's a sum of terms lambda to the s. And what you always do with the Dirichlet series, you multiply it by gamma of s, and then you can write it as a Mellon transform of something, and then you can apply these methods. So here, so here if we apply this, then you see that, of course, the expansion of this here is 1 minus lambda t plus lambda squared over 2 factorial t cubed, and so on. And so you immediately get that uh, gamma. I didn't really need the lambda. I could have taken lambda v1. You get the gamma of s, which is only defined by this integral if real part of s bigger than 0, is meromorphic in all of c. And it is simple pulse at negative or non-positive uh, integers, simple pulse, and the pole at uh, s plus n, where n is 0, 1, 2 is minus 1 to the n, n factorial. 
Of course, that's very easy to show anyway, because, and Euler, of course, knew it very well, although he didn't have the notion of complex functions and poles. But of course, the basic defining property of gamma that Euler was trying to get, it was supposed to interpolate the factorial. The factorial satisfies n factorial is n times n minus 1 factorial. So you have this fact, which is a trivial consequence of this integral by integration by parts, if s is large. And then using that, you could just move to the left, because if I know s gamma for s bigger than 0, then I can get it in the half plane s bigger than minus 1, I just divide by s. Then introduce a pole at 0, the next time get a pole at minus 1, and so on. So of course, in this case, the application is very easy, and so we have this. But now one can apply it, as I already said, to any Dirichlet series. And this is what uh, Riemann did first for the Riemann zeta function, so let's do that case first. If I take the Riemann zeta function, which is really Euler, as I said last time, it's the sum 1 over n to the s, then you see, let me call it m, because later I have too many n's, uh, m to the minus s, if you pull this to the other side, up to a factor gamma of s, is just the Euler transform of e to the minus uh, mt. So therefore, if I multiply the whole Riemann zeta function, this is what Euler did gamma of s times z of s, then what I find is that this is simply the Mellon transform of the function e to the minus t plus e to the minus 2t plus e to the minus 3t. I mean, it's the same coefficients. And more generally, this would work for any L series. If L of s is any, power, uh, any Dirichlet series, 1 to infinity, then gamma of s, L of s, is always uh, equal to phi tilde of t assuming this should converge somewhere so the ANs are at most of polynomial growth, otherwise it would never converge. We wouldn't be talking about anything. This will always be the Mellon transform of, uh, sorry, phi tilde of S, and the function is simply the sum of the corresponding exponential, sum which is actually a power series, but not in, in T, but in E to the minus T. So you convert your Dirichlet series, you use the same coefficients, but you replace N to the minus S by X to the N, where X is E to the minus T, and then that function has a Mellon transform, and you can do that. But let's first do this case. So here, since all of the coefficients here are simply 1, here the ANs may be something very deep, like the number of points on an elliptic curve of, um, over some field or something like that. So th th in number theory, these ANs may be unknown. But in the case of the Riemann zeta function, AN is always 1. So the coefficients are just 1, 1, 1, 1. This is a geometric series. And of course, we all know how to solve it. So it's just 1 over e to the t minus 1. But 1 over e to the t minus 1, that's the very definition. I mean, you can expand it, of course. You take the power series of e to the t, which starts with 1, but I've subtracted, then t plus t squared over 2 plus t cubed over 6, and so on. And then I can just work this out, 1 over t minus 1 half uh, plus, I think, a 12th. It might be minus a 12th, and so on. And by definition, those coefficients are called the Bernoulli numbers. Uh, how should I do it? It's br over r factorial t to the r minus 1. So that's the definition of the Bernoulli numbers. Probably everyone knows the Bernoulli numbers. I'll say a little more about them later because we'll need them often. For now, they're simply defined, if you wish, by this generating function. You expand 1 over e to the t minus 1. It's got a pole at t equals 0 of the coefficient of t to the r minus 1 divided by, multiplied by r factorial. It's called br. So they were actually discovered independently by Bernoulli, and around the same time, it's impossible to determine who was first, because in both cases, it was published posthumously after both of them had died. So they certainly didn't borrow. But the other was the great Japanese mathematician, Seiki, who was born, well, who died only two years after Euler was born. So he was the generation before, D discovered many of the things that were discovered in Europe and quite a few others. So this is a sequence of rational numbers, which is very famous. Uh, most number theorists certainly me, know them by heart up to, say, 15. Actually, half of them are easy, because all of the odd index ones are 0, except b1, which is minus a half. But all the others are 0. But b2 is a sixth, b4 is minus a 30th, b6 is uh, 1 over 42, and so on. So they're whatever they are. So here you have this expansion. And therefore, if I just plug this expansion into the previous theorem, then I see that this thing, 
uh, this phi tilde has poles. Well, first of all, there's the term 1 over t. So that's a pole with residue 1 at s equals 1. But then, more generally, it'll be the next pole will come from minus 1 half. That'll be minus 1 half over s. And the next will be 1 12th over s plus 1, and so on. So it has poles, simple poles, at s equals 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2, etc. A few of them, there is no pole because the Bernoulli number is 0. But now, that's not our Riemann zeta function. That's gamma times zeta. And we already know that gamma also has poles at negative integers, uh, but not at, not at 1. So therefore, at s equals 1, gamma of s is finite. It's just 1. This product has a pole. And therefore, z of s also has a pole. So therefore, z of s has a pole with residue 1, a simple pole, at s equals 1. And then you get something that's holomorphic uh, near s equals 1. But actually, it's holomorphic everywhere. Because the only other poles you get here are whatever it is, 1 uh, one twelfth, maybe minus 1 twelfth over s plus 1. You have simple poles, but s is a negative integer. But gamma of s, we just saw, also is a simple pole. And so when you divide a simple pole by simple pole, you get something finite, no, no pole at all. And therefore, you get the theorem that I mentioned on Tuesday more generally. You get that z of s is holomorphic everywhere. And you get the value. You get that z of minus n is simply minus 1 to the n times bn plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial, because this, is, this number should be n, but times n factorial, so it's simply n plus 1. So you get this for free, and that's the, that second form is the one Euler had found 110 years before uh, Riemann did it in this way. But actually, Euler did essentially what I did. Euler used this integral. He multiplied the zeta function by gamma, used his own integral representation of gamma, and then studied the behavior of that function and made sense of it, although he only looked at real numbers. OK, so this is uh, for the Riemann zeta function. You see that in no way did I use that it was the Riemann zeta function. So I get the theorem. Maybe I don't have to write it again. I wrote it on Tuesday. If I have any L series, I'll write that part again. The sum aj over lambda j to the s. So a generalized Dirichlet series, not necessarily, doesn't matter what the index is called now. Not necessarily just 1 to the s, 2 to the s, 3 to the s, and so on in the denominator. The lambda j's have to go to infinity. Then, uh, so this has to converge, which means the aj's shouldn't grow. They should grow less than any power of lambda j, which means that if I write the corresponding power series in e to the minus t, well, it's not a power series because these are fractional powers, but the corresponding purely exponential series in e to the minus lambda j t, that, of course, converges, makes sense for all positive t. Because if this converges, then these are exponentially small. They converge much better. But now if I have this, then I find, again, that gamma of s times L of s is the Mellon transform of phi, just by doing it one term at a time. We saw that the Mellon transform of e to the minus lambda t is lambda to the minus s times gamma of s. And therefore, we get, well, now I'm sorry. I, this is true in general, but it's, it's not beautiful. Let me take a true Dirichlet series for this. Sorry. Uh, because I would like the poles, in order to get the cancellation to make it beautiful, I would like the poles to be at integers. So this thing will have an expansion. I think I shouldn't have called these A. It should have had some other name because I'm using A. The expansion, now we assume that this thing has an expansion, asymptotic expansion, at 0. Then that will give me some A's. And then by what we already know, this has a pole at s equals minus n with residue, simple pole residue a n, n plus s. And then if I remember that gamma of s also has a simple pole, then I deduce that L of s is holomorphic in all s, holomorphic in, in all of c. And the value of L of minus n is what I wrote the other time, because you take this thing and divide by the, res, the residue of the gamma function. So, that actually often happens. You have many Dirichlet series which have an expansion at 0, which is just a power series. But sometimes, like for the Riemann zeta function, you also have a pole term, 1 over t. And then we just saw what happens. You have an extra pole, 1 over s plus uh, s minus 1. And that one doesn't cancel everything. And so in that case, L of s still has a pole. That's what happens for the Riemann zeta function. But it's not really important to think of that as a special case. Once you've done it, 
if you have just one term, you could subtract and multiply the Riemann zeta function and kill that term. So the, the really in interesting case is this. And there are you know, any number of examples when, when you're in this situation. So uh, maybe I'll say one last thing and then make a very brief break, although it's more than three quarters of an hour. So let me give one slightly different example, but it's much the same. Zeta, S alpha is the Horvitz zeta function. It's so the generalization of alpha is one is the Riemann zeta function. So this is the sum m from zero to infinity of uh, one over m plus alpha to the s. And then you get exactly the same thing. So this, of course, the corresponding phi of t would be the sum e to the minus m plus alpha t. Uh, and that, of course, is just e to the minus alpha t over 1 minus e to the minus t. And this is the generating function of the so-called Bernoulli polynomials. And so you get exactly the same thing. This function will have a simple pole at s equals 1, because this is a pole at t equals 0. And the values at all negative integers are given by the same formula as before, but you replace the Bernoulli number by Bernoulli polynomial. The reason I mention this is because I want to ask the audience a question. Who knows Bernoulli polynomials. I'm just even the definition. You certainly do. Many people are not answering. I mean, many people have seen, but you've almost certainly seen the wrong definition. So let me very briefly, and then I'll end uh, the first part there, and then uh, we'll have a very brief pause, and I'll talk about the Castaner effect. And the next thing I had in mind will be for next time. So let me just remind you briefly. So the usual definition, Bernoulli polynomials, is b n of x, once you've defined the Bernoulli numbers, remember the Bernoulli numbers were defined traditionally by b r t to the r over r factorial is t over e to the t minus 1. I just wrote it a minute ago dividing both sides by t, but of course it's the same. That's a completely bad definition. Remove that from your mind. That's not how you should see Bernoulli numbers. Of course, it's true, but it's completely artificial. Why should you care about the expansion coefficient of t over e to the t minus 1 per se? And this definition is even worse. So the definition in every textbook is uh, you just take n over r binomial coefficient times br times x to the n minus r. So this starts x to the n minus n over 2 x to the n minus 1 plus and so on. And the last coefficient is bn. So the usual definition is you first define the Bernoulli numbers by completely artificial generating functions. Then you define the Bernoulli polynomials by sort of a random, it's not completely random, but by some sum. You can also do it in one step by combining that Bn of x, Br of x, t to the r over r factorial, maybe it's r minus 1 again. I'll probably get it wrong because I can't do this in my head. So maybe there's a sign wrong or something, but essentially you replace 1 over e to the t minus 1 by e to the xt, and that just combines because I'm just multiplying this power series, so well, I can put the t here again. I'm multiplying this power series by e to the xt, which is the sum x to the k over k factorial, and that gives the binomial coefficient. That's completely artificial. The right definition is completely different. The right definition of the Bernoulli number is the Bernoulli polynomial is much easier. So the good definition of Bernoulli numbers is Bn is, by definition, the value of the nth Bernoulli polynomial at 0. The Bernoulli polynomial is actually a much simpler object. And the Bernoulli polynomial is the unique polynomial, in fact, the unique function of reasonable growth, which has the following property that if you integrate Bn of x dx over any interval of length 1, well, you can see that this will be a polynomial because it's, a, it's, a, it's I'm integrating a polynomial. And that polynomial bn starts with x to the n. So this is, so if a is very large, x between a and a plus 1 is always roughly a. So the leading term will be a to the n, that's for sure. But here it's simply a to the n. And there's only one function, only one polynomial, even one function of moderate growth, which satisfies that. bn is the function is average. When you average over an interval of length 1, gives you the pure powers. So we have two canonical basis for the space of polynomials. One is powers, 1x, x squared, x cubed. One is 1, b1 of x, b2 of x, b3. And this map that given f of x, let's call it i, it gives me the new function integral from 
x to x plus 1, f of t dt, that's a new polynomial. Let's call that you know, if of x. This thing is invertible because if it sends x to the n to x to the n plus lower order terms, and we've just changed one basis to the other. So uh, it, it, this is a, a much smoother definition. And all of the standard properties of Bernoulli functions, like the fact that the derivative of bn is n times bn minus 1, all of those follow trivially from that because the same thing is true on the right. So it's actually that's. It's a nice remark. Many people know it. I'm not saying it's a secret. But most people, if you ask them what are Bernoulli polynomials, would define it in terms of Bernoulli numbers and Bernoulli polynomials by the generating function. But this is a, a direct definition. And it's not even inductive. You don't have to know the previous BNs. There's a unique polynomial whose integral is a to the 7, and that is b7 of x. OK, so I'll make a, maybe a three-minute pause, just so I can erase the board and you can breathe. And then I'll. Uh, I want to give the Casimir example, uh, at least briefly. You can also, of course, ask questions, except I'm supposed to repeat them if you do. Uh, thanks, Lothar. The, this talk is much better. It's a good hint. Yeah, now I can more or less erase, except the old things that I wrote before are still there. Well, maybe another minute. Oh, I actually had one more example here that I meant to give. Maybe I'll skip it. Well, maybe I should say very briefly, the other example, I had the function e to the minus nt, n from 1 to infinity or 0 to infinity, it doesn't really matter here. What if I took the, the function, I might as well now take n from minus infinity to infinity, but I'd n squared t, and it's convenient to put pi. So this function is usually called theta, it's Jacobi's theta function, and then one sees so how does this look? It looks like 1 plus 2e to the minus pi t plus 2e to the minus 4 pi t plus 2e to the minus 9 pi t, and so. Now we can do something that Riemann couldn't do because he, didn't, uh, he couldn't quote the, the theorem about this extended uh, uh, Mellon transform, so he had to do it by hand, but he did exactly what I did. But now we know that this 1 doesn't bother me at all. So theta th tilde of t, I can just do this. And we know that the extended Mellon transform of 1, which is the pure power of t, is simply 0. And we also know that the other ones, e to the minus lambda t gives me gamma of s times 1 over uh, n squared t to the s. I hope I did that correctly. So that is 2 gamma of s z of 2s times t to the minus s. So remember what Euler did and what we did before is if I just take z of s, which is the sum e to the minus nt, of course I could put a pi nt if it made me happy, then this was the uh, Mellon transform of a different phi, which was 1 over e to the t minus 1. So there I could give phi in closed form if it's a geometric series. Here I can't because the sum x to the n is a geometric series. The sum x to the n squared isn't. So in that sense, it's worse. On the other hand, I've still got z of 2s. Uh, here, multiplied by t to the minus. Something, something is wrong with this formula. Sorry, everything is wrong with this formula. Uh, nobody stopped me. There's no t, and it's theta tilde of s. The same mistake I made before, mixing up t and s. The theta t 
tilde sends e to the minus lambda t to gamma of s over lambda to the s. So it's here gamma of s over n squared to the s. And when you sum that, you get z of 2s. So, uh, yeah. Sorry? Oh, yeah, that also. Thank you. Uh, pi n squared. Thank you. I seem to be even sleepier than I thought that I was. And I actually always call this function zeta hat. Some people call it lambda, but I can't now because I'm using hat for Mellon transform. So let me abbreviate that function. Let zeta star of s be defined as pi to the minus s over 2 gamma of s over 2 times zeta of s. Then what the difference between what Euler did and what Riemann did is that Riemann wrote the zeta function not as the Mellon transform of a geometric series, some x to the n, where x is e to the minus d, but of a series x to the n squared, which is a theta series. But now, as a consequence, so how does this function look? Let's draw a picture. At infinity, it's 1 plus O of e to the minus pi t. So it's exactly in the situation that I was. State of t has an asymptotic expansion to all orders in powers of 1. It's 1 plus something exponentially small. But by the Poisson summation form, which I assume most of you know, and I'll certainly give it later in the course sometime, so I'll just write it here. Theta of 1 over t will be theta of, uh, of t times the square root of t. So therefore, as t goes to 0, theta of 1 over t is 1 to all orders. So here, the function will be 1 over the square root of t plus O of e to the about more or less pi over t, maybe there's a power of pi. So it'll be exponentially close to t to the minus half on the left and to the right. And therefore, we know by, by what I said that this function has poles, simple poles of residue, whatever it is, 1, at s equals uh, 1 half. That's from this one, the minus a half, and at s equals 0 which then, if I change s to 2s, means that zeta star of s has simple poles if s is 0 or minus 1, uh, 0 or 1, rather than 0 or half. But we also have that theta of t up to power of t is the same as theta of 1 over t. So if you take the rules from the beginning of today's uh, talk, if you replace t by 1 over t, there's a simple relation. You essentially send s to 1 minus s when you replace t by, you multiply by t to the half, you shift by half. So therefore, this function is equal to its value if you shift by half and change s to minus s, which means that zeta star of s is equal to zeta star of 1 minus s. This is the famous functional equation of the Riemann zeta function, but it, it should be called Euler's functional equation, the Euler zeta function, because in Euler's paper that I talked of last time, he states this explicitly only for real values of s. He proves it for all integers by computing at positive and negative integers. And then he says, uh, now we can interpolate the factorials by my gamma function, which he had also invented. So this formula is true at integers. Let's look if it's true at non-integers. And then he takes s to be half. And so z of a half is divergent. Uh, sorry, three halves. z of minus half is divergent. z of three halves is very slowly convergent. But he can compute both the high accuracy with his euler maclaurin formula, which I'll talk about next time. And he checks that this is true numerically to six decimals. And then he conjectures it. So he, does, he didn't make wild conjectures. Wouldn't it be nice if this were true? He said, this is what you'd expect. And I'm sure it's true. I'm sure it's important. Somebody will prove it. And it was proved by Euler 110 years later. So this is the functional equation of Euler. But I was actually asked the question yesterday, and I've been asked many times, when you take these sums that I'll, I was going to talk about today, I'll get to next time some f of nt, where n goes from 1 to infinity. Isn't that like the Poisson summation formula? The answer is no. The Poisson summation formula says that if you have any reasonably nice function, say smooth and small at infinity, then the sum of n is the same as the sum of f hat of n. I mean, there are many variants, but the basic form where f hat is the Fourier transform. But for that, it's absolutely crucial that you're summing over a whole lattice, minus infinity to infinity. If you look at this, of course, this sum it's just the same as f of 0 plus the sum f of n. Uh, sorry, this f of n. f of n over positive numbers plus the sum f of minus n. And so that, that combination is easy. But the separate ones are very hard. That's where you need to work much harder. So this, for instance, you will not get from this the values at negative integers. You'll just get 0 times the values at negative integers, or 0. 
If you want that, you have to use the other method. I mean, it's, you, 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 you pay, it's easier, and it's much smoother, but it only works for, for a smaller collection of functions. But I did want to have mentioned that. So now let me, sorry. No, no, it doesn't. Let's discuss this later. But you, so, OK, the question was, yeah, but you can't. The, the problem, so the, the, the question was, I have some nice smooth function. And what if I just take the sum f of n or f of nt? Well, why don't I just extend f on the left by 0? But the problem is that it's discontinuous. And so f hat of 2 will be, will be huge at infinity. That sum will diverge. You cannot apply it. B believe me, it doesn't work. I mean, there's, there's no cheap way. And there's no way to guess the formula. The formula is very subtle that you get with Bernoulli numbers. And they don't show up in the Poisson summation. Everything cancels. So what happens more generally when I do the thing with f of n, if f happens to be an even function, a smooth, even function, then everything works beautifully because although you're summing from 1 to infinity up to the term f of 0, which we can forget, you're summing over all n, and everything works. So that's why e to the minus n squared t works, because it's an even function of n. But e to the minus nt, if n is negative, it's exponentially big. You can't do it. And, and you, just, you, you lose control completely. Anyway, let me go on and not uh, be too philosophical, because I wanted to talk. I don't really want to run over with the customer effect thing till next time. It's, it's just a cute example. It has no importance for anything else. But I gave it as an example last time, and so I want to say it. So let me define f of lambda. Lambda will be a positive number as the sum. But for convenience, in a second, I'll include a factor 2 pi. It just makes the formulas come out nicer. I sum over all triples of integers. So if you wish, l n and z cubed. And then I take l squared plus m squared plus lambda squared n squared. That's obviously horribly divergent. The terms go to infinity. And the question is to make sense of it, first of all, so that it becomes a well-defined function. And then to have an algorithm that I can compute, let's say, f of 3 to 100 digits. So I mean, something rapidly convergent. And then once I've done that, I can make a, imagine making a graph of the function. How does it look as lambda goes to infinity and lambda goes to 0? And what the physicists wanted is one of the two I meant to look it up. I've forgotten that for the customer effect, you need the asymptotics in one of the two directions. But anyway, we're going to get them both. So the claim is, so the question is, one, makes sense. So for all lambda, or for any lambda, I mean, it diverges for every lambda, even if lambda is zero. Secondly, uh, numerically evaluate rapidly. So here, lambda is a fixed positive real number. And thirdly, the, the asymptotics as lambda goes to zero or to infinity. So those are the three questions. And so here is first the answer. And then I'll just uh, sketch uh, very briefly what you do. And you've seen most of it already. And this is, as I said, actually everything I said today is in this paper, which is my appendix. So it's on my website. But it's also it's an appendix to a book, which is a beautiful book by Zeidler, whose name I mentioned. It's volume one of his several volume uh, introduction to quantum field theory. And so there's an appendix by, by me. And this example, and more, more or less everything I've said today, is written there. So the first statement is we're going to generate. So I want to first make sense of this. So I define z of lambda s. So this was f of lambda. I define it without the minus 2 pi as the sum l, m, and n. But now I put a prime. I'm going to take a Dirichlet series. But it's not an ordinary Dirichlet series unless lambda squared is an integer. Because this thing is not an integer. It's whatever it is. But it is a generalized Dirichlet series. Because remember, a generalized Dirichlet series was 1 over any positive numbers to the power s. But fixed positive numbers, and only s is varying. So this is absolutely in the line of what I said. The prime means, so this means we're summing. Uh, sum prime is the sum over z cubed minus the, you know, the point 0, 0, 0, so where it would be infinite. Here it didn't matter, because the square root of, of 0 is 0. So I could include that case. Now you can see that formally, if I take this thing when s is minus a half, it's exactly what it's going to be. And in fact, that's going to be the answer. So we're going to make sense of this for all s. And then my f of lambda will simply be minus 2 pi uh, z of lambda minus a half. But that's not yet an answer, because I haven't made sense of this when s. This converges uh, when real part of s is big, of, big enough. And big enough here is bigger than 3 halves. That's just an, a very quick estimate by counting the number of lattice points in some big ellipsoid. OK, so the claim is 
The claim is here, one, so I'm answering this question. Part one is z of lambda s has a meromorphic extension. So this converts only in a half plane. Meromorphic continuation to all s in C with a simple pull at three halves, where it had to have a pull because that's where it stops converging. The residue there uh, at three halves is two pi over lambda and no other poles. So it's even a little simpler than it was for the Riemann zeta function, where we had two poles. So there's a unique pole, a simple pole at s equals 3 halves. And what's more, if I define z star of lambda s, so I can't use hat because I, I'm using it for something else, if I define this just as I did for the Riemann zeta function, but with 2s, so I put pi to the minus s, gamma of s, z of lambda s, that's the definition. This only makes sense for the moment if real part of S is bigger than 3 halves. But if you believe that it's a meromorphic continuation, this is also meromorphic. Now it's got two poles, the one it had at 3 halves, and another one you'll see in a second at, uh, uh, at 0. And this satisfies the functional equation. It's not the same lambda. Lambda goes to lambda inverse, and here S goes to 3 halves minus S. Yeah? No, this is what I wrote. I said this is like what we did for the Riemann zeta function, but there I zeta of 2s, and that was times pi to the minus s gamma of s. But zeta of 2s is the sum n squared to the minus s. You see that here, if I didn't have that, and if lambda were 0, this would be zeta of 2s, and that's the reason that it's 1 half. So it, it's, it is what I wrote is, is what I meant, which is not always the case in particular today. So it's really pi to the minus s gamma of s c of lambda s. So I claim these two things. It is a meromorphic continuation. And then that at least makes sense of the function, because then f of lambda will formally, as I said, it's just minus 2 pi z of lambda minus a half. But if I put s as minus a half, this is pi to the half z of minus a half. That, when you work this out, is exactly the minus 2 pi that I included. So then I, I simply define this to be z hat of lambda minus a half, which is by the functional equation, essentially the same, well now I'm not going to do it in my head, lambda to something, uh, up to a constant, uh, some stupid power, it's going to be one over lambda and uh, three halves minus s, which is two. So I guess the power is lambda to the one half or minus a half, can't do it in my head. So you see that at s equals two, this thing converges, but it's miserable convergence. It's only barely beyond the limit of it stops converging at three halves. Two, it converges very slowly, but it does converge. The lambdas become one over lambda, so now it's up to find the function as some very simple multiple of the new function, and now it's n squared over lambda squared, but now to the, to the power two rather than to the power you know, one half in the numerator. So at least now it's converging. So I've, if you believe me on this, then I've done the first step. I've made sense of it, but it's now been replaced by convergence series, but extremely slowly convergent. So what do we actually do? Well, of course, you now know what we do, because it's just a special case of what we've been doing. Uh, we see that I have to make the phi of t here will be the sum L, M, and N. And I should take M different from 0, but I don't have to. Uh, maybe I should put a pi to the minus S. So maybe I'll put a pi here just to make myself happier. Uh, here, I sum over all L, M, and N. Now, one of those terms is when they're all zero. That was forbidden here because you'd have zero to the minus S. But it's certainly OK here. I just have a term one. And we know that under the Mellon transform, as I've generalized it, that term just goes away. So phi tilde of S is the sum of the corresponding things where S isn't zero. So therefore, it's pi to the minus S, gamma of S, times what I called Z of lambda S. And that's exactly what I just called Z star of lambda S. So in other words, this thing is already a Mellon transform of a very, very simple function. But now if you look at this, you see that this just splits as the fate of t that we already had. That was e to the minus pi L squared t. Again, the same thing. And here, theta of lambda squared t. And now you can see I could actually stop. It's all over but the shouting. Because we know that theta is 1 to all orders at infinity. This theta also. So this is 1 to all orders at infinity. Of course, thank you for nothing. 
one term is one, and all the other terms are exponentially small. So e to the minus something positive times t. So at infinity, this function is like one. But at zero, remember theta of t was to all orders, one over square root of t. So this is 1 over square root of t. This is 1 over square root of t again. Here, 1 over lambda square root of t. So it looks like 1 over lambda t to the 3 halves to all orders. As that gives me a simple pole, which has residue 1 over lambda, maybe 2 pi over lambda, if you keep track of the constants. And there are no other poles, because that's how it is. But now, if you remember how I defined this thing, it's the sum phi less than or equal to t plus phi greater than or equal to t. And each of that is the integral from, let's say, t to infinity of e to the minus whatever it is, which happens here to be L squared. Plus, but you could do this for any Dirichlet series. You take what's called the partial L function. Let me just put here any number, xt. This is the function that we know if t were 0, we just be gamma of x, x to the s. This is, it has many notations. Let's call the gamma s of x. It's a partial gamma function. It can be computed extremely rapidly. And, it's, and of course, it's exponentially small. I mean, up to a power of x, it's just e to the minus xt. So this is a function which, if x is large, is extremely small, whatever t is. And so what you get, just by breaking up the integral the way that we already saw, is that this zeta star of lambda t, which I just defined as this Mellon transform, is equal on the nose. And it's a, you know, a three-line calculation or one-line calculation. It's equal on the nose to the sum of two terms. The first one is 1 over the square root of t times the sum over, again, all integers l, m, and n, of gamma minus a half of pi times t. I might get the pi's wrong, but it doesn't really matter. And then the same number we had before. So this looks complicated, but remember that gamma minus a half of x is exponentially small. So if t is something reasonable, you know, 2 or something, then only a handful of terms will contribute to this, because this sum of squares, after a few terms, will be bigger than 50, and you'll have something you know, exponential of minus 100. So this is extremely rapidly convergent. So this is an exponentially, conver exponentially rapidly convergent sum, as opposed to what we had before. Exponentially convergent now. But I'm not finished, because this is exactly the formula for one of the two integrals I had. But I had to do the other one. But the other one, after a simple change of variables, is exactly the same story, except that the s has gone to n. I could do it for any s. But sorry, this should be for s. Here, the way I'm doing it now, it's simply f, f of lambda. So I'm already specialized. You could do it for every s. And then you'd have a t to the s and t to the 3 halves minus s. I'm not bothering. So here it's exactly the same thing, but now it's the other one. It would be in general gamma s and gamma 3 halves minus s. Now the t has become 1 over t because I inverted, and the quadratic form is the same, except that the lambda squared has become lambda to the minus 2. But whatever lambda is or whatever t is, this is again you know, exponential, more than exponential. It's Gaussian. It's e to the minus a square. Well, not really, because when you have three squares, there are lots of sums of 3 squared in the box. It's, but it's more or less, it's exponentially rapidly convergent. And so this second sum is also exponentially rapidly convergent. And it's a sum of only two terms. It's not an infinite sum. There are two contributions, t big and t to the right of t and to the left of t. And both converge extremely fast. As I said in the paper, I give for, for a small list of you know, five or six values of lambda, I give the 50 value, 50 digits value of lambda takes a, a second in Paris. But what's really beautiful in the method, that's what I emphasized before. Remember, we defined our integral originally by splitting up into two pieces. But then if you change the splitting point, you change both the integrals by the same thing. It canceled. And so it had to be independent of t. So you compute this numerically when t is 1, 2, uh, you know, minus, minus uh, 1.5. And each time you get a 50-digit number, it's a sum of completely different terms. But the sums are equal to 50 digits. So you not only get the value, you get a, a certificate that you haven't made a mistake in your calculation or in your program or in your thinking. So that's extremely nice. And there are many, many situations that work like that. You have a free parameter. And the, the, the final thing has to be independent of the parameter. And that's wonderful, because there's no way in numerical calculations to know if you've made a mistake. You get a 50-digit number. Nobody knows if they're the right 50 digits. It's crucial in all numerical calculations to have a way to check, like a functional equation, or, or in this case, that it depends on a parameter, and it shouldn't depend. So now, once you have this, I'll just write the last part, because, well, I'm not, not quite running out of time. I actually have. Uh, uh, 
two uh, thirds. Well, I can even write here what gamma minus a half and gamma is. Gamma minus a half of x, if it's just the special case of what I wrote, it's e to the minus xt dt over t to the three halves, which is essentially what's called in tables, and it's pre-programmed in many packages, like in Paris, it's called the complementary error function. So this function is just a function you can call, just like you would call sine of x. It's, it's a standard function. It's already on your computer. And the other one, gamma 2 of x, at least if x is not 0, it's simply 1 over x plus 1 over x squared, e to the minus x. So that's really a standard function. And so you know this is completely computable. It's a, it's a very, very rapidly convergent sum of extremely simple and easily computable functions. So it's absolutely computable to arbitrary precision. So that answers the second question. And finally, the third question is, uh, I'll just give the answer, but you can, you can try it as an exercise. If you do this as an exercise, just using this description, theta of t squared, theta of lambda squared t, and you have to think a little how it works. Then remember I told you that this theta of t squared at infinity is just one term, one, and so is that. And similarly, at, at, minus, at zero, it's just one term. So we know very precisely how this looks at both ends. But then we've thrown away one term because the LMN equals zero term was secretly removed. And in our Mellon transform, I have to remember that I removed the term one over S, so it gives me two more terms. So I end up with four terms, one coming from the behavior at infinity, one the behavior at minus infinity, and two are the one, the LMN equals zero term that I omitted, but here I'm including in both terms. So I have to include gamma minus a half of zero and gamma two of zero after some renormalization. And so when you do that, what you find is very pretty that the asymptotic expansion is actually much simpler than the exact expansion, namely as lambda goes to zero. There are only two terms. So f of lambda is equal to 2c over 3. c is about 0 0.91596554. But I'll say what it is exactly in a second. 2c over 3 times lambda inverse, so there's a, a pole term. Then there's a linear term, pi over 3 lambda. And then plus O of, it's, it's all its terms. It's actually lambda e to the minus pi over lambda. Well, I can drop the lambda because it's small. It's exponentially small. So in this case, it's very explicit. And as lambda goes to infinity, then there are two other terms, completely different from these two. One of them is pi squared over 45 and it's lambda cubed, and the other is another constant, c prime, which is 1.43774554, dot, dot, dot. And so it's c prime, here there's zero power, and here, well, there is actually one over lambda, but it helps a little, but here there's the square root of lambda, it hurts a little, so to be honest, I have to include it, but it's still exponentially small. So in other words, in both directions, and then in, in, in the paper, I'd already given the table with the exact values for lambda is one-tenth, one-half, one, two, and 10. And if I took the two values each to 50 digits, and then I took this thing for lambda as a tenth and this for lambda as 10, then like 40 of the 50 digits were the same. And you see it's really incredibly close. So it's not just an asymptotic expansion. It's an almost exact because it terminates uh, to all orders. So I could have just dropped this and said the asymptotic expansion to all orders is just two terms at infinity and two other terms at zero. And what's needed for the actual customer effect in electrodynamics uh, is uh, either, the, I think it's this one with the 45. I've actually forgotten, I'm sorry. And I haven't actually told you what C is, so I can end with that. Let L4, it's actually L minus four of S, be, I'll write it in a fancy way that number theorists like. It's the Kronecker symbol minus four over N, N to the minus S. So that's a Dirichlet series, but the Kronecker symbol is simply one if n is one mod four, minus one if n is three mod four, and zero if n is odd. So this is just the alternating sum of one over n to the s for odd numbers. And so Leibniz already had found that L minus four of one is pi over four. And just as Euler showed that the Riemann zeta function, his zeta function at even integers was a rational multiple of uh, uh, the powers of pi. Similarly, this one at odd numbers, it's pi cubed. I didn't look it up or work it out. It's pi cubed times something uh, rational. Uh, actually, it's not, it happens to be rational. It's really a rational number times the square root of four, but the square root of four happens to be rational. If I had minus five, it would be like that. So all of these numbers are known, and the C 
It, and also there's a functional equation but for the same argument. And so this is simply L minus four of two. It's called Catalan's constant. It's maybe the fourth most famous constant in mathematics after E and pi and gamma. Maybe it's not the fourth, I don't know the order. Nobody's ever, I think, fixed it. And this function, rather surprisingly, is also expressible in closed form in terms of the very same form, maybe not surprisingly given what we did, except now it's the value at three halves, which you can also compute as many digits as you want in many different ways. So we get, we have an explicit formula for the expansion coefficients. So this is a very nice example because you start with something that looks ridiculous, this sum squared of L squared plus M squared plus, well, let's just take N to be one, L squared plus M squared plus N squared. It looks ridiculous, but you can make sense, but you can compute it to arbitrary precision. You can compute its asymptotics as that coefficient changes. And it's actually important for an application. This was really needed in, in classical physics. OK, so it's exactly 5.30. It's very unusual for me to end on time. But uh, so if you have questions, please do, except I have to remember to repeat them. The question can also be about last time or about anything else. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Wait, first let me repeat the question for people who are listening virtually. The question is, I gave a recipe, given some function phi, which had reasonably nice behavior at zero and infinity, I defined a phi tilde of s, and the requirements were that if phi was very small at zero and infinity, my new function had to be the original Mellon transform given by an integral, so that's unique and even injective. And of course, it has to be linear. I, I, I can't do something different for every function. It has to be a linear procedure, a linear functional. And the question was, I gave a procedure that assigns to phi, a meromorphic function phi tilde of s. What if I thought of something else? Couldn't there be other answers? And the answer is basically, I think, no. So what I showed is already in what I did, there was a free parameter. There was a, a big amount of freedom. But if you did it with different values of the parameter, it didn't affect anything. And that almost tells you that it's unique because whatever else you do should also work for those two pieces separately. But those two pieces are uh, meromorphic in the half plane, or holomorphic, in fact, in the half plane. So any other function that agrees with them in the half plane is, and is also meromorphic, is the same function by uniqueness, and the sum is the same. So based, I think that it's inconceivable that there's any other way. Of course, I can't claim that if somebody else did something completely different, but it seems to be impossible that you could find certainly any natural procedure that would give you a Mellon transform for every function in this class, which for the functions where it's convergent would be the original one, but which wouldn't be this one. It, it seems to be completely impossible. And here uh, you saw that it was, I mean, we had something to depend on this parameter t. So this formula is not a formula. It's a formula for a function of lambda and s and t. But in fact, it doesn't depend on t and it never will. But that's not really a proof that there can't be anything else, but I'm sure there isn't. So if you're asking from my opinion, my opinion is I'm sure there isn't. And I'm not sure if it's a little hard to prove that there's no other, nothing, one can't think of anything else. But it, it is really very canonical. And also very simple. Once you've get, gotten used to it, another answer is, of course, if Riemann did it, then it must be the right thing to do. Because Riemann was Riemann, so he wouldn't have done it if it, if it wasn't the right thing. No one, then a no one virtual. Well, people aren't shy. They would ask questions if they had them. So then we stop, and uh, we continue on Tuesday. Uh, by the way, for people here in the ICTP, I'm sure you've all seen the posters, there's a big event in the ICTP on Monday, which is the Ramanujan Day. I think we've never had a Ramanujan Day before. For it's quite a few years, the ICTP gives a yearly Ramanujan Prize to a young brilliant mathematician who did something that somehow reminds one of Ramanujan. But now they've decided to have a yearly Ramanujan day. And since I now have a position here, and my position is called the Ramanujan International Chair, I'm supposed to give kind of an inaugural lecture. But it's supposed to be very popular because there will be, we hope, some non-mathematicians in the group. So there'll be a fun lecture. And I think it's streamed. One can hear it on Zoom, so also people aren't here. It's called 
Ramanujan and the partition function. But it's very low key. I mean, if you think this is low key, wait till you see that. OK, so let's see you all on Tuesday or on Monday. <laughs>